and then we go to our first keynote speaker of this afternoon. Our first keynote speaker is Mr. James Doty, chairman of the PCAOB, which oversees the audits of public companies in order to protect the interests of investors and further the public interest in the preparation of audit reports. A warm welcome for Mr. Doty. Thank you. Oh. Well, I, I apologize for the alarming visage that's being visited on you on the screen here. Um, I have to say that uh, I greatly appreciate being invited to this conference. Uh, it's a privilege to speak to and with some of the most experienced and progressive thinkers about the audit's role in capital markets today. Uh, it's also a, senior, a sincere pleasure, again, to see so many of our colleagues in this audience, uh, such as Janine Van Diglen. I should begin by saying that I'm speaking today on my own behalf. My views are my own. They should not be attributed to the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, uh, any members of the board or its staff. Uh, the PCAOB's work increasingly involves coordination with our counterparts in other jurisdictions, many of whom have representatives here today, and that coordination runs very deep. Together, we have begun and are making stronger still a foundation upon which our nations can build vibrant programs for capital formation and investment and economic growth. Our work here is in the trenches, together and literally around the same table as an exam team, reviewing audit records and engaging with audit personnel. Our joint inspection teams act as vocal and present representatives for the dispersed masses of savers who comprise the investing public. We also work together on policy. It's been useful for U.S. policymakers to monitor and learn from the economic effects of experimentation here in Europe and elsewhere. Both our joint inspections and this policy work support a vibrant profession that can continue to meet society's expanding needs for assurance and services. As you demonstrate here in Europe, the profession must innovate to continue to meet the needs of the public. The FEE has been a leader in bringing the audit profession into the dialogue with policymakers. I want to thank Olivier and Hilda, the entire staff of the FEE, for this opportunity. And what a year it is for the FEE to convene us here in Brussels to take stock of where we are. We come together as a financial summit begins, one which could have an important bearing on the future direction of the Eurozone and with implications for all of our economies. To scan the topics for this conference imparts your focus on change, in some cases, potentially transforming change. In such times, we look for reference points that enable us to chart the right course. For example, does the audit remain critical? to robust capital formation and economic growth. What can audit regulars, regulators do about that and what are we at the PCAOB doing? These are the questions I want to discuss with you and in so doing, I will offer three propositions. First, investor confidence in the auditing of public financial reporting is, I say, critical to expanding our capital markets. This is my first proposition. Whether the audit is compulsory or not, the companies seeking capital pay for audits to receive a benefit. That benefit is in the form of a lower cost of capital than capital market, market participants would otherwise require. Access to more capital markets, greater investor demand for the securities of these users of capital follow. Now, although it's companies that receive the benefit of the audit, governments by requiring the audit for an issuer to enter into their capital markets also make an investment in audit quality. States do this, in other words, as a service to the public. The audit is a critical contributor to economic growth, I say, without which there is in jeopardy we've seen social peace, preservation of democratic institutions. But the assertions of a broad public benefit implicit in my first proposition would not now go unchallenged. I think a lot of people today would question this statement as counterintuitive, perhaps even completely wrong. They see the audit as a regulatory cost, a required cost of doing business, best kept as low as possible to meet the compliance objective. They would point to the fact that the public rarely shows interest in the audit. They don't feel the demand of public demand for more, more information or better audits. These are these critics. And for its part, 
This part of the public takes the audit for granted and demonstrates little interest in it except in the breach. Well, breaches arouse acute public interest, but if the breaches are rare, some might yet think that the breaches are a bearable cost of a production system, a protection system that is not, un, that is not un, necessarily bearable, unbearable the rest of the time. In other words, an occasional breach is a problem, but it doesn't outweigh the, uh, the compliance cost of the whole system. Critics of the audits ask, why can't rely on market demand or lack thereof to resolve the trade-offs between the benefits of the audit and its cost? In other words, why not let consumers decide what is audited, what is not, and how? Read internal controls of financial reporting. There are indeed circumstances, I say, where markets do efficiently, fairly, and without regulatory intervention, or at least with minimal regulatory intervention, resolve the benefit of the audit relative to cost. These circumstances, however, as I say, may not hold in broader public markets. Take the example of capital markets established by venture capitalists and entrepreneurs. VC investors and entrepreneurs work out in real time and directly how the VC investors will monitor the entrepreneur's use of the VC's investment. With technological advances, VC monitoring and entrepreneur reporting has become more efficient and expanded to suit the information needs of VC investors. VCs and entrepreneurs work out through direct negotiation the elimination of reporting that is no longer useful. The investors monitoring in venture capital markets is as efficient as technology and the imagination of the VCs and the entrepreneurs permit. But venture capital is overall a small segment of our capital markets, and that brings us to the public market as ultimately the broadest and longest term source of funding for business and economic growth, and not to mention an important outlet, outlet for early stage investors seeking liquidity. Public markets can also offer business a lower cost of capital than systems that rely on what I will call bespoke monitoring. But in both kinds of markets, <clears throat> the point of monitoring is trust. In a public market, the providers of capital need to be able to trust the users of capital which requires confidence in the monitoring of the users in their application of the capital. It's the problem that Beryl and Means articulated early in the last century. It's the separation of, of um, ownership and control that we, we still wrestle with. If the market can trust the company's application of, of capital, the cost of capital can be reduced to, measure the, uh, to the measure of the premium for business trust, that is, the risk the business will fail for operational or competitive reasons, not for fraud on the investor. The challenge that public markets face is that the direct link between the providers and the users of capital to conduct monitoring and to establish trust present in private equity is not available to specify the nature and form of information provided. Auditing is the critical proxy for that missing link. That's why auditing is critical to expanding our public markets. And this leads to my second proposition. Intervention to regulate the audit is justified when that will encourage the public to provide capital to business. It's justified by making monitoring more, effect, more efficient and more effective and more trustworthy. That intervention starts with mandating the audit, but for it to be worthwhile, we must make sure that it can be effective in serving this purpose and that we are alert to mitigate any undesired consequences of intervening. Critics have observed that since the audit is required by law, that which might be the auditor's natural competitive instinct to meet and grow public demand for their service is dulled. Moreover, there is counter pressure from the companies themselves, as we just heard, to keep the cost of monitoring low and the scope narrow. All the public markets know about the audit is that an auditor conducted an examination of the financial statements according to specified minimum standards. The only reputation the audit, that the market knows is that of the firm. Without real data on the audit, the market is left to rough estimations of reliability. The handful of great firms are deemed to be more reliable than the rest. And since quality varies inside each of the great firms, as in all of the large-scale human enterprises, investors apply the law of averages and assume the great firms are, on average, equally reliable until a problem is resolved or, or discerned. These imperfections lead some to ask whether we could construct a better world if we left the audit entirely to choice. 
forget about whether the public or the consumer should de detect or should demand what the information is. Leave the whole issue to choice. Would removing the franchise liven the auditor's instinct to strive for public demand? Well, the franchise does distort the market for audit services, but I think the root issue lies elsewhere. Just as dispersed public investors lack privity with the corporate users of public capital, they also lack privity with the auditors charged with protecting them. That is, the audit is an imperfect substitute for real privity. That's what the, what the VC capitalist has. For the auditor to achieve its intended purpose, to provide the investing public with the kind of monitoring that will adequately fill the void of privity between the providers and the users of capital, we must, as regulators, knit tighter the relationship between auditors and the investing public. It's not practical to fill the void left by the absence of privity with a contract, given the dispersion of investors. We must do it with mechanisms, some of these regulatory, to influence culture, such as by encouraging auditors to compete for investor confidence, just as they would for client satisfaction. Choosing the levers that will positively affect culture requires care. But as Adam Smith said in The Wealth of Nations, in general, if any breach of trade or any division of labor be advantageous to the public, the freer and more general the competition, it will always be the more so. Evaluating our laws and regulations with this advice in mind is good for investors, good for users of capital, and good for auditors alike. Hence my third proposition, adopting policies that encourage auditors to compete for investor trust and confidence offers one of the biggest opportunities for global growth we can imagine. If law and regulation can give the public a stronger basis to trust the audit as a market mechanism for monitoring, despite public investors' dispersion, we have the potential to unlock more capital, to fund more entrepreneurs, and create more jobs. But we must give the auditors incentives to meet the investing public's needs in order to be able to trust that mechanism. In the remainder of my talk, I'd like to explore how our policy initiatives can, I believe, draw us closer to that goal. And first, I think our audit inspection regimes are motivating enormous strides in quality, as Janine has said. But we have more work to do together on maintaining high quality in the audits that investors in multiple markets rely on. And second, I want to comment on certain policy initiatives that European regulators and the PCAOB are pursuing to align auditors to investor needs. In 2014, the PCAOB con conducted more than 200 inspections of firms that audit or play a substantial role in an audit of an issuer, including examinations of portions of more than 200 engagements across the four largest U.S. firms, including engagements of, of some of the largest companies in the world. We also examined portions of 570 engagements by 158 other U.S. registered public accounting firms and 57 non-U.S. registered firms. We will conduct a commensurate number of inspections in 2015, requiring inspectors to travel this year for more than, to more than 25 different countries. Many of these inspections will be conducted jointly with local regulators. We now have bilateral cooperation agreements with 19 foreign audit regulators, 11 of which are here in Europe. We're able to jointly inspect regulate with regulators with our colleagues in Austria, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Hungary, the Republic of Korea, the Netherlands, Norway, Singapore, South Africa, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Chinese Taipei, and the United Kingdom. I'm grateful for the support of the European Commission to continue our inspection work in and with European Union mem member states, although this will require another renewal of the EU, uh, EU's adequacy decision in 2016. To make our joint work as effective as possible, we've dedicated significant resources, including specialists in information technology as well as coordination on risk analysis, all of this in, in aid of inspection selections by us and our colleagues. In addition, as our relationships deepen, we will naturally but quite deliberately learn ways to work more efficiently together such so that we reduce duplication of work. The aim is to work seamlessly together to meet our respective inspection mandates and we're very much on a path to doing so. Together with our counterparts around the world, we're creating a network of regulators to match the networks of firms. There was a time 
when national regulators merely aspire to have relationships with other national regulators to call on in a breach. Cooperation meant keeping each other informed, albeit working separately on separate mandates, with each regulator limiting its own work to its own borders. But global audit firms don't stop at national borders, and as audit regulators we have learned from hard experience, neither can we. Globally active firms affects each of our jurisdictions, sometimes in quite different ways. More than a decade ago, we recognized that we have a shared interest in marking and making our network of regulators as strong as possible, and it required a new paradigm. The commitment of the European Commission and the individual member state authorities with whom we enjoy a great friendship has been critical to designing this new form of partnership through joint oversight that makes us all stronger, more efficient, more effective. Investors in our capital markets need to know that we're delivering on that shared interest by making sure that any auditor that enjoys the privilege of operating in a market will be expected to comply with the market's stated standards. I look forward to working with EU Commissioner Jonathan Hill, Director Hugo Bassi, and the head of the unit of audit and credit rating agencies, Alan Deckers, on continuing and deepening the cooperative inspection and other oversight arrangements we have built. We can help each other do that. Well, say a word about the PCOB's initiatives here, uh, new policy initiatives. Uh, throughout this two-day conference, there will be much discussion about the reforms of the European Commission and member state authorities, and the PCAOB has been attentively watching these developments and considering our own versions and our own situation. Our goal is to enhance the relevance and re reliability of the audit, and that takes policies and standards that motivate auditors to be fiercely committed to investor protection. We continue to explore ways to provide investors more information about the audit and who conducts the audit. A cornerstone of this effort is our consideration of disclosure to investors of the identity of the engagement partner and other firms that conduct the audit. It's the custom in many jurisdictions, including here in Europe, of course, for engagement partners to sign audit reports in their own name, in addition to the name of their firm. And this has, I believe, very significant cultural implications. The identity of the engagement partner plays a key role in investor confidence and capital formation in those jurisdictions where it is provided to investors. Reward recent studies in Sweden, the UK, Chinese Taipei, where partners routinely sign their firm's audit reports, show that disclosure of the engagement partner's name makes a difference to the investing public and to the markets. The PCAOB issued a concept release to consider engagement partner signature in 2009, preceding my tenure. It was based on the recommendation of an expert panel convened by the U.S. Treasury Department to examine the sustainability of a strong and vibrant auditing profession. Since that's not been the custom in the United States, some commentators on our concept release expressed fears of unintended consequences attending personal signature, including principally liability litigation risks. These comments helped us develop alternatives. For example, whether simple disclosure without signing could give the market valuable information without increasing litigation risk. So I asked the staff to develop a proposal on mere disclosure as a compromise, first in 2011, then again to seek more comment on costs in 2013. Based on investor calls, we also proposed disclosure of the names of other firms that substantially contributed to the audit. Auditors ought to be fighting, I think, for the attention of investors, clamoring to meet investor demand better than the next firm putting forward their star auditors known for their integrity, as any other professional association does. But many still express concerns about risk, again, primarily litigation. Well, I believe there is a middle ground that will provide investors this disclosure in a form that reduces auditor perception of litigation risk. We've developed a form which auditors could file with a PCAOB, call it Form AP, a Form Auditor Participant. At the end of the month, I expect to seek comment on such a form, and I hope bring the U.S. into line with international standards soon. At the same time, we plan to open a new public dialogue on other potential indicators of audit quality. We have already had several discussions about these measures with our standing advisory group on standard setting. So I think the board is now nearly ready to consider issuing a concept release on a set of measures that could be tracked by firms audit committees or markets. Audit quality indicators 
is a powerful concept if it can be made to serve our markets and, our, and align the interests of auditors and investors. The audit reporting model. We continue to explore opportunities to enhance the form and content of, content of the audit report to provide the market value for investment in the audit. In response to calls from major institutional investors and others to make the audit report more informative, we've conducted extensive outreach with investors, auditors, financial statement preparers, and others. To obtain broader public views, we issued a concept release and subsequently a proposal, and we've held two public meetings. Governments around the world have heard this same call and they're developing parallel reforms. And we spend a lot of time monitoring those developments and analyzing the relative cost and benefits and other economic considerations behind these various approaches. The United Kingdom was an early mover in the reporting model. We now benefit from a growing body of evidence and experience there. The Financial Reporting Council has recently required that what, what they call in extended audit reports for financial statements for periods that began on or after October 1, 2012. And I understand there are approximately 900 UK reporting companies that are subject to the requirement. I'm encouraged by the FRC's March 2015 report on, co on compliance and user benefits in the first year of extended auditors' reports. Auditors appear not only to have met the new requirements, but in many cases to have voluntarily made further changes to enhance the informativeness of their reports, innovation in the reports and the disclosures. The new requirements thus spurred innovation and competition on the basis of the quality and usefulness of the report. The FRC noted exceptional reporting on detailed audit findings in relation to identified risks, informative use of explanatory diagrams and graphs, and well-organized presentations that relocated the opinion at the beginning of the report instead of at the end. The FRC experience is useful for our consideration and analysis, but the real test is whether the new reports affect demand, and in that respect, investor reaction is even more illuminating and encouraging. And I refer, of course, to the Investment Association's inaugural awards to recognize outstandingly useful audit reports. And this is the kind of investor I interest, I think, that's been lacking. Uh, this is the kind of an uh, investor intervention that free markets to, to motivate auditors towards services that will gain and build investor confidence require. I'm also eager to see how implementation of the EU's April 2014 law expanding auditor reporting will play out through presumably some level of experimentation as member states implement the law and various initiatives to improve the inform informativeness of the audit report. There's also the IAASB's new reporting standard to disclose key audit matters, which is effective for audits of financial statements for periods ending on or after December 15, 2016. This means that more than 100 markets across the globe will soon have expanded audit reports. At least one market, the Netherlands, has early adopted. We're closely following these developments as we advance our own initiatives in order to evaluate results and learn the lesson of experience. The last initiative I want to highlight is our work to raise awareness among audit committees of audit risks and challenges. Audit committees play an important role in protecting investors' interest in accurate financial reports and reliable audits. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act provided audit committees of the United States companies enhanced authority to play a critical role in hiring, firing, compensating, and championing, championing the auditor. Next to establishing the PCAOB, this express authority may be the most significant of the Sarbanes-Oxley reforms. To help audit committees champion the audit, the PCAOB aims to better equip them with information about the audit, our inspection reports, and the auditor's strengths and weaknesses. We've been meeting with audit committee members for a few years now, and these meetings have given us the background to broaden our outreach and take it to a new level. To that end, we have developed a, communic a communication tool to provide audit committees insight from our work. We call this initiative audit, the Audit Committee Dialogue. This is an interactive digital publication with charts, data, and tips for audit committees based on insights we've gleaned from our inspections. In designing it, we consulted with several audit committee members to get the benefit of their direct input on the kind of information that would be most, use, most useful and actionable for audit committees. The dialogue 
highlighted key areas of recurring concern in PCOB inspections of large audit firms, as well as certain emerging risks to the audit. The dialogue also pre presented targeted questions that committee members may ask their auditors on each topic. We hope that these insights may be useful to audit committees in their 2015 oversight activities, and we look forward to continuing the engagement with additional dialogues for audit committees at least twice a year. Well, the PCOB initiatives I've described are intended to help align auditors with investor needs, but I believe they also help the profession maintain its viability in the 21st century. There well could have been new demand for audit services in the last several years had public confidence in the audits been greater. But for nearly a generation of professionals coming of age since Enron, it hasn't materialized. Why is there not greater demand for auditor assurance on XBRL? Why hasn't the public turned to the audit profession for assurance on environmental reporting, cybersecurity, sustainability? Well, the public wants an assurance that environmental safety, social, consumer standards are adhere adhered to, and that our companies and institutions are free of corruption. Capturing that demand, though, requires attending to the public's desire for confidence and trust that the audit is the watchdog the public expects it to be. The public needs to hear auditors bark when there's a problem. In the last several decades, as many countries have expanded their investment in public capital markets, we've learned a lot about the risks and the weaknesses in our audit model. We've instituted important reforms to address them, including standards, robust inspections, disciplinary programs. But it's time again for leadership in the audit profession in meeting the demands of today's markets and developments. I applaud the efforts of both the audit regulators here convened and the professional associations here in Europe in taking on these tough structural issues. I look forward to continuing partnership in advancing this important work, and I also look forward to your questions. You've been a very attentive audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We know you have a very busy agenda, but do you have some time for a couple of, que couple of yes. questions? Yes. Oh, so great. Yeah. Um, well, we had some questions coming in with our system. Buzzmaster, maybe you can see them oh. over here. There's one question which came in from uh, Peter Kries. Uh, maybe we can make that one a bit bigger. Yes. Left in the top, he asks us, can regulators support innovation and experimentation in the audit area and accept necessary deviations from standards made in public interests? Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. <laughs> yes. It's not easy. Uh, I, I think one of the problems the audit committee ha that the audit profession has had is that they have tended each time there has been a, uh, a crisis or a change in regulation to take the most extreme technical and uh, perhaps also revenue producing approach to implementing it. One, one of the things that the audit profession has not done is to maintain, Paul George is smiling and laughing at me, but they have not managed to take a reasonable approach to the imposition of an auditing standard and remain confident uh, in, in their interpretation of it. And uh, often this is um, justified or attempted to be justified in terms of the, the hawk of the regulator looking over their, their shoulder. Uh, the regulators really have not been hawks. Uh, the regulators talk to the auditors about this. Um, the audit firm uh, can, has a full opportunity to explain why it did what it did and did not do what it did not do. But I think as that process, and, and these are risk-based audits, as Janine said. So as we go forward with this process, we hopefully would get to, to that wonderful state in which the auditors do that which is really needed and not just that which they can possibly interpret a standard to require. Okay. We have another question from somebody with the name uh, Jean-Luc Barlet. Convergence still on the agenda. Yeah, uh, it's convergence yeah. still on yeah. the agenda. You know, convergence is um, a descriptive term for a process of, of evolution and development. It's, it's neither uh, an arbitrary goal uh, nor a milestone that can be measured. Um, we, we, um, we worked on, have worked on our audit reporting model with a clear view to what Arnold Schilder and the IWASB did 
with um, the audit reporting model and key audit matters. Uh, we have ours talks about critical audit matters. They're not the same. They're going to be different. But the differences are going to reflect differences in the audit market. They're not going to be differences that will, will prevent good auditors from issuing the right kind of report uh, that, will, um, that will specify what they've done and show what they've, the conclusions they've come to. I do think here's an opportunity for the audit firms to begin to issue um, opinions, that, opinions that conform to uh, ISA standards in the United States and vice versa. Audit firms tend to not like that because of risk, but as one very good auditor told me the other day, we're in the business of risk. It's the other half of trust. They're in the business of trust, but the business of risk. Okay. Yeah. No? Um, I'm from Holland, as you might know, and in Holland, TTIP is on the agenda nowadays. Uh, it's in the news for all of the time. And my question to you is, could you comment on the expected changes that TTIP might bring to our fields? Could, could I comment on the changes that, the what? The TTIP changes. Oh, it's not on the, it's, oh. it's a question I, uh, which I'm just sorry. came in my yeah. mind. Um, TTIP is coming to Europe. And uh, my question is, what are the expected changes to our field? The ex I'm sorry, the expected changes to... Uh, um, uh, which, which the TTIP uh, brings to our field. Oh. Oh. Could you comment on the expected change the TTIP might bring oh, oh, to our oh, field? Oh, sorry. No worries. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, well, I think we're, we are watching this very carefully. There is, of course, the possibility that audit will be incorporated into uh, that agenda, into, into that agreement. Um, I think that will make a big change if it, if it happens. And we're going to be working carefully with uh, our colleagues here and in the union so that if, in fact, that does, uh, that does happen, um, we will be um, playing a constructive role in audit regulation. We have, we have no intention of having a, something like the, uh, the TTIP um, render what we do uh, obsolete and uh, archaic and unreflected. I, I, don't, I don't worry much about not getting to a regime with, with our European colleagues that provides for a better audit oversight for the reasons that Janine Van Diglen was talking about from the floor here. The need for public trust in that audit is too big. Okay. Yeah. Um, am I in the clear? It's, yeah, you made yourself <laughs> very clear. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank being you. here, yeah. uh, Chairman Doty. Give him a big applause. <laughs> it was great to have you. Well, one of your um, wishes for a takeaway was information. Did you have enough information in the first part? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you is my first reaction.